one of the things I've been doing in lockdown is trying to write a book about reductionism. Mm. Because for a long time, I've been convinced that one of the great gifts of the arts to the world is to remind us we don't live in a flat world. Mm. And particularly, a certain kind of scientific reductionism I have in mind where you're not only reducing reality to one type yeah. of thing, one level. Yes, yes, exactly. But uh, you're also reducing all explanation. And all quality, type. just all quantity. A certain yeah. kind of causality yeah. is going to explain everything. And it, it struck me, it's very important, we, if the arts do function this way, that we don't see them as anti-science. Certainly not. Or, or anti-reason or any of the other things that tend to go on on that side of the, the equation. Um, but but some wonderful material has been coming up about about poetry, particularly in this connection. Not least the way it is multiply evocative. We talked about resonances yeah. earlier, where a particularly a, a word that may seem flat to yeah. adult suddenly attains or, or yeah. um, accrues to itself a mm. whole stream of resonances. Yes. Now that seems to be very basic to what you're doing. Isn't it? Uh, absolutely. An enormous yeah. theological significance that has. Well. I, I think so. What, what's, what's the theological significance of all that? Uh, the, the, what the embodied na nature of knowing? No, of the anti-reductions in general, or poetry. Oh, oh poetry, yeah. Poetry, why, in other words, particularly given the current yeah. crisis, which will come on to in a minute, but, but why is poetry theologically important in a flat world? Well, I think, I think it's because it, it engages and restores part of the Imago Dei in us, part of the way in which we're... I mean, Tolkien in his poem Mythopoeia said, we make still by the law by which we're made. So if we think of the physical universe as made by a person, I mean, I'm not talking about the process or the, I mean, this isn't about the Big Bang or evolution no, no. or anything, this is long, but I'm saying it, it, it is caused to be by love and it means something. Yeah. Now, poetry is precisely readdressing things with meaning, yes. eliciting meaning from them, allowing them to become a language of personal exchange, yeah. rather than a collection of objects. Yeah. And uh, the person who really thought about this again was Coleridge. I mean, Coleridge had got to the insight that the things in the world, the phenomena, might also be meaning, that they might be like, quite early, before he'd theologically come back to a full, fully grounded Trinitarian Christianity, but quite early in, in that that blessed summer of, of seventeen in ninety eight, he he'd written uh, Frost at Midnight, where he imagines his son growing up, uh, you know, amid the lakes and crags and yep. sandy shores, and then he says, "So shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who doth teach himself in all in all things in himself, great universal teacher, he shall mould thy spirit and by giving make it ask." So he'd already recognised there was a kind of, we needed to know things as not only intelligible in the sense that they were reducible to an underlying mathematical pattern, but intelligible in the sense that they were constantly saying something, that they were an utterance. Utter, going, go back, going back in fact to the word outer, that something has been made out of. But if it's been made out of, then there is an inner that has made it. Yep. And it's the inner, it's the resonant depth of the consciousness, which is inner, which is missing from reductive science. And so, how does that relate to the person of Christ? Well, Coleridge asked exactly that question and made a great journey. I mean, beginning by observing moonlight, actually, and then he suddenly had this wanted to say, why is this reminding me of something inside me as well as something outside me? And he suddenly writes in a notebook in 1805, it is Logos, <laughs> the creator and the evolver. Eventually, he came to a fully grounded thing, and basically what he said is this, is that the, 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 the prologue to John's Gospel suggests that all things come into being in and through Christ, who is mind, who is Logos. And that the c capacity to perceive things, i.e. mind in us, is also Logos, that, uh, that he is the light which lightens everyone that comes into the world. And as it were, th th things shimmer into being when those two uh, aspects of Logos the little one in us and, and the great one who is making these things connect. So we actually genuinely have to... Now this is... Well, you could say resonate with each other. Yeah, resonate, yeah. exactly. So so in fact, he uses the word... So so he famously says that the, the primary imagination is the living power and prime agent of all perception, all human perception. And then he says, and is a repetition in the finite mind 
of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. And he always loves to call God I am because he feels our own I amness is the link. But in fact, I'm glad you mentioned resonance because he returns, he modifies that word, that word repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation isn't quite right. Yeah, and he returns to it with a musical How metaphor. Right at the very end of the book, literally in the final paragraph. He talks about standing out at night and looking at the stars and knowing that their sons with other worlds around them and thinking about it scientifically. But then also thinking about them. And he says, I, I look out at the, at the outward beholding of these twinkling sparks of their awful death, only to hold the soul steady in its inward act, capital letter act, of pure ador adoration to the eternal I am and to the filial, to the eternal I am and to the filial word that reaffirmeth it from eternity to eternity, whose choral echo is the universe. That's lovely. So actually what he says, all of it, all of this, I even as you this perceive up. it, is the choral echo of the exchange of love between the father and the son, as each delights in the being of creation. Now, reductive science isn't going to get you there. But it doesn't mean that it's, it's reductive science is like analyzing the chemical qualities of the yes. paper that the poem is written on or, yep. or the geom geometry of the letters or the statistical frequency or taking an oscilloscope to a Mozart yep. concert. You can get a lot of factual information, but you don't hear the music. Yep. So then you have to engage the imagination through the arts in order to have this, to wake up this thing in you, which can perceive the choral echo as an echo of an exchange of love. Uh, and that, that allows, and it doesn't deny any of the scientific things you've no, but, it, exactly. but it allows. It's also very different from the kind of, I think, rather kind of difficult and plodding natural theology that was done by a kind of paleo, who took the, the reductive thing and then said, oh, God must be something well beyond this, but let me see what I can deduce about him from this actually rather inadequate model of the world that I've made anyway, which is not going to get you anywhere. Yeah. Whereas if you once accept the notion that the mind in whose mind you live and move has revealed to you something of who he is in the work and person of Jesus, and particularly in those witnesses um, to it, and then you take that and start trying to reperceive the world in that light, yeah. suddenly the whole thing tingles with life and meaning and you get it. Yes, lovely, lovely, thank you.